be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Be Here Now guest podcast. This series features a collection of teachings and conversations centered around mindfulness, spiritual growth, and living a life in balance. Each week, our diverse network of guest teachers and hosts offer up wisdom and practices from a different spiritual path and perspective. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash donate. So here we are together on this retreat. And as Pascal had said this morning, you know, we're kind of in the heart of the retreat, in the middle, the middle part. And we've kind of started to settle in a bit more. And tonight I just wanted to take this evening to just share some of my own insights and reflections about the body about this practice, about awakening. You know, it's not as if we're, this retreat is designed to you come here and then we have a PowerPoint presentation and go, here's awakening in the body. Step one, step two, step three. You know, we, it's not that simple. <laughs> it's a lot more complex and each person and each and has their own rhythm and there's cycles and there's, understanding and there's all kinds of different levels of this conversation uh, that I want to talk about. It's radically simple yet complex as you've probably noticed, right? The instruction is pretty simple. Sit here, right? Don't worry about anything, just let go and then ah, all hell breaks loose, right? On some level in the mind, you know, it's like ah, what is going on here? But this connection with the mind and the body is, I think, really, really interesting. And I think in some way it's the cutting edge for me and my own practice. And what I've also seen as the evolution of sort of Buddhist practitioners in the West. Um, you know, on one hand, we can look and see so much connection just being made. You know, the neuroscientists and Buddhist practitioners are having a love affair right now, right? So examining the brain and meditation and how the effects of compassion practice and how does this affect the body? And there's all these studies about how the mind affects the body, how healing happens, right? We know this, we hear this. There's hundreds of stories online around healings and all kinds of things and how we work with our mind and how it affects the body. So again, this connection about mind and body. You know, I was reading a story last night by Herbert Benson, who's an MD, and he's the director at the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. And he wrote this whole book called Relaxation Revolution. And it was about how meditation and Tai Chi and Qigong and all these practices were having a huge, huge, a much more beneficial effect than what he'd been doing for years you know, giving for high blood pressure and hypertension and all these stress-related things. So this is very much in in our consciousness. This We kind of get a sense of this. So this is one aspect of the teaching that is really important, that we know um, that we're being impacted. The mind and body are infinitely connected. And I want to explore tonight many different aspects of that and the impact on us as human beings awakening, human beings walking the path of Dharma. You know, how does the first foundation of mindfulness fit into this? So again, just kind of weaving a lot of things together. You know, the body in spiritual life is a bit of a mystery. You know, I don't feel like there's that much out there. There's a uh, a little, I guess you could call it a poem. Jack likes to read this. It's by Eduardo Galliano, where he writes, the church says that the body is a sin. Science says the body is a machine. Advertising says the body is a business. 
The body says, I am a fiesta. And so, I am a fiesta. You don't hear that very much, do you? In spiritual communities, if you think about traditional, you know, like I grew up and I went to a Catholic college and I never heard the body as a fiesta, you know. It's a lot of conflicting information in spiritual tradition around what the body, what do we do with this body, right? It's like, it's a lot of focus in Dharma, I feel that in this transmission of Western teachings of the Theravada school has been mostly mind. Even though our practice is sitting and walking, a lot of the emphasis on body is sort of, it's all about the mind, right? The body, it's sort of some teachers think, oh yeah, what do we do with our body? Well, just feed it, take care of it. And, you know, go back to the meditation, the mind, think about, you know, there's just been this, for me, it's a strange transmission that I've gotten that sort of played into my own upbringing, right? And, and how I grew up is sort of in this Christian uh, community, you know. My family's, my mother wasn't a Christian, but I grew up in the, in the it's being around, right? And so in some way, the body was a sin, right? And I sort of took on this thing of like, oh, to be a practitioner, I have to renounce my body, right? I can remember when I was very young and heard the Dharma, I wanted to be a nun. And then I thought, that's it for the body, you know, like lock it away in a closet, shave the head, that's it, you know? And, and even as a woman, it became even more confusing. It was sort of like an attacking of the female form, like your body is particularly, you know, sinful. It's like kind of the archetype of Eve, right? So then you even take on more of this conditioning, like, oh, well, what do I do? Here it is. Here I am. It is confusing, right? And yet I know clearly I want to walk the spiritual path. So I felt like there's been very little guidance um, other than sort of the Buddhist doctrine, the Satipatthana Sutta, which we've been talking about, this beautiful sutta, the four foundation of mindfulness. But other than that, the Buddha, there was not a lot more in there about uh, different aspects in this school, more in the Tibetan schools, about energy and body and kundalini and all these words that it's like, what, what are these pointing to? You know, what is this about? I also have come to think about the Buddha's own struggle with his body. And I think that he too didn't know what to do with it. You know, here he had had, you know, when he was a prince, all this privilege and, you know, for 29 years lived in the palace where he indulged in all the senses, you know, it's written about he had the best silks and the best food and entertainment of 500 and women and, you know, and it, it was a prince, right? Princes have access to things, right? It's the whole thing. So I think he indulged a lot, you know, of uh, indulged and, and to such a degree that he saw, wow, this doesn't really lead to happiness, you know, and then he renounced. But as he left the palace and he renounced one life, he went very, he made a very dramatic exit into a whole nother, where suddenly instead of the body where he was carried around on, you know, they said like they even described him being carried around and sort of like, you know, those beds or those movies you see where people are fanning people, you know, with big palm flowers. And, you know, he was kind of held as this, you know, protected in this way, treated with so much uh, honor. Then he went from being somebody that was a complete renunciate, right? It's described in the text that he ordained himself on the bank of the river, right? Cut his hair, threw his hair down, took off all his jewelry, right? All his adornments and his silks and, you know, all this kind of thing. And then picked up some scraps, right? And then put that on and said, all right, this is the first step in renunciation, right? This is, I've renounced this life. I've now entered into a different life, right? I'm now a seeker. I'm now a spiritual practitioner, But I think one of his, the things that I'm fascinated about was he too thought that the path and what was taught at that time was this intense mortification of the body, was this way of somehow, let's break through the body, right? Let's conquer the body, right? So 
extreme practices, you know, these yogic practices of standing in certain postures, looking at the sun, lying in all kinds of uh, places, eating one grain of rice a day. He went about these practices for a very long time. And that was what was also common. These were teachings. He studied with other teachers before he sort of went off on his own. These teachers that were in the forest that had students and disciples, he wasn't the only one who was under this assumption that somehow it was to conquer this. It was to free yourself from this body that is is sort of holding you back, right? Full of lust and greed. And somehow that's in here somewhere. And if we could just transcend out of it, right? We'd be free, right? So there was a sort of wanting to break our body in some way. There's a statue, uh, a big statue that's up. I, I almost, people will want to go look at it if I tell them exactly where it's on, but it's on the land going up kind of by the far parking lot where you come in and there's a barn over there and Way in the back, I think one day Philip took me over there. He said, have you seen this Buddha statue? And I had known that there was these images of the Buddha when he was starving to death, right, basically. And you could see his ribs and he was emaciated. And uh, these images are they're around. This is sort of a symbol of his ascetic practices, the, the, the route that he took. So anyway, there's this giant statue over there that's a bit... I don't know. I think we would find it unpleasant on some levels. I think it's way over there. You know, it's not like the other one by the kitchen, you know, where it looks really healthy. He's emaciated. You could see ribs and his face is gaunt. And anyway, so the Buddha did that and he almost died. He was very near death. In some of the Tibetan texts I read, it said that he had uh, fallen. He went to go to the bathroom and he fell flat in the mud. Right. He couldn't, he had no strength anymore. He had starved his body to such a degree. He had gone to so much length, wasn't bathing, wasn't eating, practicing hour after hour with this, with this intensity, this ferocity, with no regard for limb, right? No regard for the form. And, um, he realized that wasn't getting him anywhere. He went, Oh my gosh, I don't even have the strength to meditate. Right, I'm, I'm near death. And then I read this one Tibetan text where it's the gods were watching going, he's going to die. So I had a little bet. Is he going to make it? Is he not going to make it? Right? Why? Like, oh, he's got to make it, right? He's got to wake up from this delusion, right? That somehow this is the path. So he had this insight at the right moment of the middle way of the body, right? He, he saw this, what am I doing? Why would I, you know, what are we doing? This isn't it. This is not it. And so in that moment, the legend is Sujata, this beautiful uh, spiritual practitioner woman, sort of a goddess archetype, came by with a bowl of rice who was on her way to a temple, offered it to him with this devotion. He ate a huge meal. He went down to the river. He took a bath and he was like, okay, let's get some balance here. I actually need this body, (laughs) This body has to help me. This body has to serve me in some way. We have to work together. So there, the middle path was sort of broken open, right? And he renounced those other practices. It's like, that's not the way, right? And also, I feel that that's an aspect of the feminine coming in, right? That we can be so hard. I think we, and some people approach their practice in this way, right? There's a fight going on. It's me in this moment. Who's going to win, right? And we can get very deadly serious about our practice, underlined deadly many times, right? And uh, it becomes an epic battle. We enter into the hall and we look around, right? And we're very calculated when we sit down. And uh, that's not the way. That's not the helpful way. So I feel like in some way I like to tell the story, sorry, and this is my own interpretation, but that there was the feminine came in, the softness, the surrender, like, ah, oh, no, I need this body, right? Eat food, take a bath, rest, right? Stop forcing. And he had a memory of being young in his father's garden where he just sat comfortably under a tree, and the whole of the Dharma disappeared in his mind. He started to be, enter into a state of relaxed awareness and concentration without the struggle, 
right? So this is, I think, an important teaching and one I like to highlight and how he related to his body. So I think, you know, the Buddha had his own understanding and his confusion and his realizations. And I think I've gone through mine of I'm trying to figure out what to do with this body of mine. So I think when I first came into spiritual practice, I faked it a lot. It's like everyone would say, be embodied. And I would think, what does that mean? I was very young. So they all were walking. So I would act like I was walking too. Really not anywhere near present but imitating, I would go stepping, stepping. Every now and then I think I was trying to be present, but I had no idea what it really meant to be in my body. I actually didn't for a long time. I couldn't figure it out. Like, why would I want to be in my body? Isn't it more fun to, you know, I felt like when I was in my body, I suffered, right? And I was sort of jealous too of uh, certain people that I felt like were really in their body, like I, would, I just see women who would at yoga retreats. I usually hated yoga people because they seemed very in their bodies, right? And I was jealous and they'd be like relaxed and free in their movements. I used to be, walk like this. I was very, you know, contracted. And I was telling that to uh, Philip. Remember how I used to walk, Philip? I used to walk like I was, I didn't even know I walked like I was in complete suffering, right? I thought I was fine. You know, I couldn't feel that. I didn't, I wasn't awake to that. So I was very jealous and judgmental of yoga people because they would just be fluid and free and I'd dance around and I'd be like, God, they're so conceited. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we give that up when we practice. We don't act like that as a yogi, you know. Again, the deadly serious, right? Who actually loves their body? We should all be renouncing it. It's, a, it's suffering. It, you know, again, not quite understanding the full teaching here, right? And again, if we have these ways already, we can twist the Dharma to uh, meet our belief system. If you already have a view and there's some way in which you view yourself, we can twist it into make it okay, right? Like, yeah, it says this, right? I, I This is okay. So I used to kind of... I used to do that, and I had a hard time. I didn't understand why I didn't enjoy being in my body until I began to understand more about trauma. This was a huge piece. And I think collectively there's an awakening back into the body, and not only in uh, the Dharma realms and, and spiritual communities, but also in the realm of psychology. Many psychologists more and more are moving away from traditional maybe talk therapy into somatic-based therapy. People are switching from the mind and including body, right? Like, okay, we've done worked on this for a long time. Let's try what's happening in the body now. Like what's being held in the body? So this whole realm of somatic therapy is birthed itself. A huge amount of people finding value in this, which actually is a form of mindfulness, right? We help one another be in the body, feel what's going on, release trauma held, right? It's almost like you have a mindfulness coach, right? It's like, okay, let's go in, let's go out. And we assist one another in this way. I've had a lot of training in this in the last few years. I'm not a traditional psychotherapist, but it's been extremely helpful because we all carry these threads in us, right? This is something that's really um, helpful and the results have been incredible for people. Breakthroughs, removing obstacles that have been plaguing them for years, more freedom, more ability to access the body, the joy of the body. So I had a lot of trauma and I didn't know how to really release it. Just from growing up, childhood, I just suffered abuses and those kind of things. I grew up in a very urban environment People don't think of that when they see me, you know, they think of me, they see my name, they think, oh, it's probably Santa Cruz Mountains and it's a little hippie community maybe, you know, but no, it's very different. I grew up in East Long Beach, right on the Compton border. Drama everywhere, trauma everywhere, people fighting, this going on and that going on. And I, 
I'm writing about it in this book about looking out of the window. I wasn't allowed to go outside uh, when I was young. So we, we were always kind of locked in our apartment building. Not in, My mother didn't want us. She was like, afraid. But we would look out of the window into the parking lot. And it was like all the drama in the world happened right there. You know, this, this, this. So when you grow up like that, and as many of you know, we carry this stuff. Rather, you grew up in an urban environment or maybe you grew up in somewhere where it was a look that had all the look of being peaceful. You know, the beautiful suburb, right? And then inside it's, you know, some there's a violent father or there's abuse or we go and we have these experiences in our life. Well, we carry them in the body. We, we carry the energy. We carry the residual of that. This, again, produces a lot of emotion, right? And we don't understand why we can't feel. Sometimes it, it manifests as a numbness, right? We can't rest in ourselves. This is actually a really big part, this numb, numbness that people report again and again. Like, I can't feel my body spring. I can't feel it. And I relate to that. I couldn't feel my body either. It was a slow waking up, you know, and I remember when I, I used to just walk with my hands like this, all bent over, people tried to help me. They would go spring and they would put my shoulders up and then I could feel it for a moment. But then I thought, oh, I, there must be something going on. There's an energetic, something's happening in my belly. And through these practices of trauma-based practices and going to all kinds of things, I was able to start to release these energies And then I was able to move to different places in my body and inhabit it. You know, you start, it's like I was a slow moving in to inhabiting, 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 inhabiting. And it's still happening now. Like I feel like I'm still coming in to this experience. And it's unfamiliar, but it's also exciting because this inhabiting frees up a lot of power and a lot of compassion and a lot of feeling a lot of intuition. I think it's important to understand what we're losing when we're not embodied. I think one of the things that I read about that was very interesting to me was a study at Harvard. I actually tried to find it. I have it on a thumb drive that I didn't bring with me. It wasn't on my computer. And there was a study done at Harvard. And again, there's all this science happening um, you know, with compassion, with meditation, with mindfulness-based practices in general. So this, the study at Harvard was about, again, empathy. This seems to be a big, uh, a big topic of exploration, empathy, compassion. Last weekend, I was down at Stanford teaching a program on compassion because they have a whole compassion institute, you know, where they're researching compassion. Other schools have taken this up. Um, to actually research the health benefits, the mind benefits. You know, this is, I feel, very exciting, actually. So the study was they took an average group of people, a, a controlled test group of people, average, you know, people in Boston, you know, in different ages and backgrounds and so forth. And then what they did was they set about, they, they did a, uh, an experiment where they showed them very horrific images of people suffering, war, pictures, you know, pictures that we've seen on the news and pictures from the 70s of Vietnam, people in various degrees of suffering, poverty, and they showed them these images and they had them all wired up testing their blood pressure and their pulse rate and their heart rate and all these different things. And then they would ask them questions as it was going through. How is this making you feel? What what do you notice? And most of the people said, yeah, it's sad, but yeah, I'm doing fine. Yeah, it's really, yeah, I get it. Yeah, it's suffering. Yeah, this is really hard. Yeah, but I'm, I'm okay. I'm great. But their body was registering something alarming, completely different. The heart rate was moving. The pulse was rapid. Their, their body was noting extreme stress, right? But they weren't saying that. They weren't, they weren't voicing that. And they and the researchers thought there's a huge disconnect here between their mind and their body. They're not they're not in touch with their body is actually experiencing experiencing stress, 
right? It's experiencing the images. It's actually feeling the imagery that it's, it's happening, right, on another level. So then the um, half the group uh, stayed as they were, and the other half was given a mindfulness-based stress reduction program to go through. So they did six weeks of meditation. They practiced at home. They did these different things. So they brought the group back. So obviously the group who had meditated were vocalizing much more. They could feel their body. They could feel the feelings. They could feel sadness. They could feel their, their, their heart was racing. They could say, you know, they were reporting the second time much more awareness. I think this is important for our healing of our planet in some way. Right, we've got to make this link, right, to what's happening. Otherwise, we live like we're zombies, right? We're not seeing what's happening. We're not feeling what's happening. We're somewhat cut off. Those people who are cut off from their feelings, imagine how they have their families, right? There's a certain realm of awareness they're just not accessing because they're not feeling their body. So it's important that we start to make this link as we learn to heal the trauma. Now on retreat, one of the things that I've noticed about the body, and this is an insight, is the body seems to be, and this is so interesting to me, and uh, Philip included this in his article that went out to you, the body seems to be a storehouse of information. Now, I didn't give the body much credit before. I didn't think this was so. But now I'm seeing that this is true. This seems to have stored somewhere every single thing that's ever happened from birth, maybe even before then, maybe even before then. Who knows how much information is stored in in this body of ours. And... This is the part that's interesting. When we sit, we begin to access this material, right? So this has both both important uh, ramifications and also it opens up into the realm of pleasant and unpleasant, (laughs) right? Because as we start to be with our body, we start to learn from the body, we receive information, we heal and we let go, we start to see that this whole process that we're going through has an incredible intelligence to it. Now I bow down as I look back over the last five years of my really intense healing of my work with the body. There has been a profound intelligence at work, right? And I can see how this opening led to that and this healing, oh, and this energy and this, this happened, it led to that. And oh, isn't that interesting? right? And this knot in my back had so much to do with my father. And I could see how each thing led to the next thing. So as you sit here, you are going to go through a very intense purification process. This is purification. This is the path of purification, right? We are essentially energy. This is an energetic phenomenon happening, right? Mind and body, they're linked together. So as the mind starts to dump out all the junk, right? And you could kind of see that, you know, over the first few days, we sort of, so there's a great emptying out happening, right? Sort of like we untangle tangles, mind tangles. I think the Buddha, in one of his discourses said, who can untangle the great tangle, Right? Some way that's what we're doing. It's like all these knots, right? And out of the emptiness, they appear. Like, how's this one? It usually starts like with what Pascal was saying I, 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 me, 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 me. And right, the knot appears, right? And it involves a lot of other people and dramas and who did what and how it all happened and what we hated, what we loved, what we've lost, right? There's this constant telenovela playing, right? Full of knots and dramas. Right, intrigue and suffering and romance and suspicion and right, all of it in a big knot. And as we sit here, right, it starts to arise out of the mind. We have to somehow make friends with this, right? Somehow we have to let it go. Really, you could sum your whole spiritual life up into those those words, let go. But letting go is brutal. So difficult. You know, we have to kind of work out to that. 
kind of spiritual workout to let go, let go. So as the tangles arise in the mind, they come with a fury of emotion, right? We remember that incident in the fifth grade where we are humiliated. It can come back with a full color, glory, 3D effect, right? We're back there. We relive that. We experience that. Now I'm using just a a sort of a funny analogy, but we relive everything that happens on the cushion. This retreat is often life review. Have you noticed this yet? A stream of incidences start to play out in the mind, right? And we say, ah, and we feel what, if they were suffering or not suffering, right? Depending on how we acted, right? If we went off and went crazy in some moment, ah, the regret, right? We feel, right? It's a purification. We feel them in the body. We feel our emotions in the body. It's all connected there. There's a certain amount of surrender that's needed into this process and a certain amount of trust. You know, sometimes I'm amazed at what happens on retreat amazed. These are hospital settings. I always say spiritual centers are hospitals. You know, and we come in and we're like, you need an IV and a, you know, we're half dead, right? Numb, maybe just totally, you know, crazy on some level. But only you know that. Only you know how you arrive here. It's all kind of hidden, right? Only we know the inner content of what's really happening, Right? And so as we, we come on retreat, this purification then starts. We have to let go. We have to make friends with it. We have to allow this intelligence to work. On the three-month course, I used to sit so many times. I've done many long retreats. And in those long retreats, it's just so much happens. You know, and you can't plan on what's going to be purified. I hope you know that. Any you know, you can come drive to Spirit Rock and say, well, I'll work on my mother issues on the first day. Then, you know, I'll let go of all my body issues on day two, and then I'll be free and awake in my body by the third day after Qigong. It doesn't happen like that. You have no control here. None. <laughs> Whatever arises, arises, right? And for such a a practice of just such calmness, so many injuries. On the three-month course one year, people were going to the hospital, it was like blown out knee, neck going out, this happening. It was like an extreme sport. You know, I was thinking, (laughs) but all we're doing is walking so slowly. And then we sit down and there was like suffering, a whole, felt like a whole wing full of people getting nursed. And it was like, wow, look at all this purification, Right. If anything, we're way calmer than we are in our normal life. We're taking way less risk. We're just walking slowly around the center, right? Then we sit down slowly, and then we stand up slowly. And then, ah, oh, these injuries, ah, oh, this suffering was happening. People crying in pain and headaches and vomiting. I mean, it was, this was just me. <laughs> right? Maybe I'm projecting it all out, huh? But I wasn't because the managers were driving people to the clinic and bury it seemed like every few days. You might be one of those people like, oh my God, I always feel great. Here I am on the body retreat suffering so much. Like what's going on with my neck, right? All of these knots that we carry, you know, it's energy, right? Energy, energy compacted, like how we view ourselves. If we walk in the world and we're braced all the time when we come on retreat, we will have excruciating neck pain as it all starts to unravel. Again, the body is amazing in its intelligence. It knows how to move. It knows how to heal. It knows how to move itself. There's times in practice where my body with sort of this inner body worker would come on. And it would start to go make all these adjustments and it'd feel energy vibrating and popping. And it's a a level of PT. It's a factor of uh, one of the enlightenment factors can sometimes almost feel like somebody is working on you very, but it's internal. The body knows how to heal. If you get cut, it knows what to do. It starts to heal like that, right? It's this wisdom that we don't always recognize. 
you know, because our society doesn't live in this wisdom, the all of the body. We live in it from a view of, is it good looking? Is it not? How old are you? What's going on? You know, the it's so, so much of the outer is just based on just desire, right? An aversion, right? Do I like that body? Do I not like that body? How's my body in compared to that body? Well, it's bigger, it's smaller, it's taller, it's lighter, it's darker, it's whatever. There's so much dukkha about the body on this whole superficial level and we can get lost in that. And granted, that's a big place of suffering. It has been for me. Being a woman, being a black woman, it's like, oh, well, my body is dark. What does that mean? Right? Oh, well, people see my body and they think certain things and they see my family and they think things, you know, oh, they're suffering in that. But we process that. There's a lot to that, right? There's a lot to people, how you're born, your gender, what what body parts you have, right? So there's a whole realm of suffering that we do have to process through, but then we go into the mystery of it. It's like we go beyond that to the depth of what is this form? Like, ah, this is a miracle, right? Just look at your hands for a second. It's a you know, just moving your hand like this, so many things in the body are required to make that happen. Just moving your finger, just like that, right? Thousands of neurons firing and nerves going and messages. It's a miracle in some way. So I think it's important that we start to trust this body more. Right, and we understand that it, it 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 gets hurt and disappoints us. You know, we don't want to see the body getting old. That's a big one, right? Even when I look at my passport photo, I think, yeah, don't look like you did at twenty five. <laughs> you know, forty is different. <laughs> and I think, ah, oh, yes, but this body in itself is finite. It's impermanent. It's a vehicle that we use for liberation, right? We can use this magical body. It's working with us. It's trying, right? And people report they feel like they just run over their body or they disregard it, they hurt it in all these ways. And the body has a a place of going, wait, what about me? Right? I'm with you on this journey. Let's go together, right? Me and the body, we can, I think my whole process of the last few years has been to fall in love with it again, or not even again, I think maybe for the first time, to understand like, oh, how you could help me, how you are helping me. When I move energy out, it's like, oh, the mind is freed up now. And this process works together. It's really beautiful. It's important to have a lot of compassion with this process. Because I think somehow about these body retreats is they bring up a primal energy. There's something about this form and the energy inside and our experience as primal, as roots, right? We sort of go into the root chakra here, right? And this feeling that we always have that we're not okay. You know that feeling that a lot of times we have, like you might notice this in your meditation For the last couple of years, a big part of my meditation has been touching my body and going, oh, with spring, it is okay. Because my body would be vibrating as like a small child. Like something's not okay, something's not okay. But see, I was present for this. So I could say, yeah, you are okay. Body, you're okay. It's an aspect of some collective trauma that I think as humans, we, there's a certain, I think our restlessness and our, are, are going fast is to outrun that feeling. But I think one of the, the processes of what we do with compassion is we welcome spirit home, right? We welcome ourselves home again. And only you can do this. You could go to rituals, that helps. <laughs> you know, there's, there's candle lightings and there's the healers. And, but in the end, it's going to be you and your own body. Right, and can you welcome it back home with compassion, right? Where, where we go off and we get lost and then we, we pull back these pieces of ourselves, that piece from the traumatic five-year-old, we pull that back. 
or that horrific incident that might have happened later in our life. We, that part of the body, the, the mind left or pieces left, we pull them all back together, right? And we let go of that which we don't need. So that's the healing. The body is doing that. It's saying, oh, release this, bring this. And if we listen, we could feel that. It's very important to approach this process with extreme levels of care, right? Because these the, the really fragmented parts, they won't return unless you have tremendous love, right? They just won't come home, right? The process, it needs to have refuge there. And not everybody may know what I'm talking about when I use this type of language. It's sort of shamanic in some way. But this practice is shamanic, right? And very earthy, right? We're from the earth. Our body is made of the elements. We are earth people, right? We are of the earth. We resonate with the earth. Another story that I thought was really touching um, was um, I'm very interested in, I have a, I guess you could say a very soft spot for the soldiers who are coming back from war and those suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder. I just feel really, I don't know, the urge to do something. And there's been a lot of people doing something, a lot of uh, there even was a day long here for soldiers and there's been things happening. And um, I, this was inspirational because I really love animals and I really like dogs a lot. I'm sort of, I wish, you know, when I'm old, I'll be the, the lady with all the dogs. I'm sure one of those people with dogs everywhere rescued, you know, animals and so forth. Um, but this study was from University of San Diego and they have you know, a very hard time working with soldiers who have extreme post-traumatic stress. I mean, they just, other than heavy medication, there has been no possible, seeming like there wasn't a solution to help them, right? They're at a loss of what to do. So this study was showing, I got this uh, in the newsletter, it was showing tremendous results helping the soldiers. And so what it was, was that one of the worst aspects of post-traumatic stress is what the soldiers and anybody who has gone through, this isn't just military, this could be anyone who's lived through uh, a war zone, um, is what they're calling night terrors. Because all they keep waking up, they can't sleep. And you know, you can go without water, but if you go without sleep for a period of time, you can become very psychotic and actually die from that. Right, the body needs a certain amount of sleep. It can't function without that downtime. It's actually an act of love to get rest. Right, it's a it's a way that we re- regenerate. So the night terrors they were reporting were extreme, and they didn't know how to help the soldiers. So they started to train these uh, these really really intelligent, intuitive dogs. And so they had a huge success story in what they gave. They did a, uh, you know, piloted these dogs, kind of how dogs have been helping other people for so long. And so the dogs, they trained them to stay up all night long and then to sit by the soldier's bed, right? So they're trained to stay there. And then when the, the, the ex-military goes, starts to go into the nightmares, right? the dog takes his paw out over the chest area and starts a rhythmic tapping, right? And taps. And then the soldier wakes up and right and reorients, sees the loving dog, you know, feels comforted and then can go back to sleep. But isn't that sweet? This dog. I was like, everybody should have a dog like this. It should be like mandatory, right? When we freak out, the dog's like, like, oh, thank you, Scruffy. Like, back to the present moment, right? But over time, these soldiers are like, fall in love with these dogs. And they're like, oh my gosh, I wake up. The dog is like just this rhythmic tapping right over the heart. And they, and they even had this clip. And the dogs are very precise with their paws, like straight out. <laughs> I was like, these dogs are so sweet. They're like Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, animals. So, But again, this was getting them back into their body, right? This was a way to help them re ground, right? To come to, to, to re, feel like they're okay. And so the, the success of them being able to sleep and to get rest and to begin a whole process of actually working with the material has improved greatly. 
So that's all I think. I just, I think that's all I wanted to reflect on with you tonight. And I hope it's helpful in some way. But I, I just wanted us all as a community to think about the magical aspects of how our body is wise and how we can listen to this wisdom and we can start to feel why you're here to, to feel your body and to treat it as an old dear friend, a wise elder, right? And we sort of take a humble approach to it, right? Instead of forcing it or uh, yelling at it or demeaning it because it doesn't do what we want or look how we want, you know, all those old tricks, old they just suffering anyway. We can just, and to like re look at our body in a different way. It's this, this ancient, timeless tree of life, right? And in it is a storehouse of knowledge. Who knows how vast this goes back to, right? And we can sit and we can feel and we can listen. And all of the, the things that we need to let go of, they're in the body. But all the beauty that we can learn is in the body and opening to the love that's timeless and the bliss and the joy and the freedom and the power and the wisdom that's there. We also can tap into that. So I think I'll leave it on that note and maybe all begin to listen to this great tree of life, this human form and all its magic and mystery that is still unfolding. We have so much to learn here. So thank you for your attention. And we'll just sit for a moment and see if you can feel into your body in this moment. And just notice what's happening. Feel in your belly and your breath. In your hands. As we have compassionate presence, open receptivity, no struggles needed. We just sit and listen. Listen to the wisdom inside and out. <laughs> 